All right, we're recording. Um, I'm going to apologize for the natural lighting that is going to just kind of be everywhere because I'm in my car. So, I talked on Twitter a little bit about Avengers Endgame, and I've been thinking about it, I've been tossing thoughts in my head, I've been listening to reviews and people talking about uh, themes and the end, and... I wanted to talk about my own thoughts because Endgame's a pretty big deal as far as movies go. Um, I can't think of a time that we've had a series of movies like this. Um, Star Wars would be about the only thing um, that would be like this as far as the scopes of movies, but not really. <laughs> so, with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, you have um, a whole bunch of movies that are spanning a period of over 11 years. Um, They are uh, individual characters and a single team and each has their own specific stories and yet also part of something that is a larger overarching plot. Um, And it just got wrapped up And that's kind of a big thing. Um, This is going to have all the spoilers for Endgame. So, you've been warned. Um, I enjoyed the movie. It was fun to watch. Um, I thought that as far as a wrap-up to... The overarching Infinity War plot, as it were, um, I thought that it was a satisfactory wrap-up to it. Um, There are things, thoughts, uh, but there, yeah. So, um, I'm not really going to talk about the Captain America problem. Um, uh, When I was in the theater and I was watching the movie, I took the end for Captain America at face value um, because for the type of character Captain America is, that is the kind of ending you want for him. You want him to have the quote-unquote wholesome ending. Um, He's the all-American character. He's the penultimate hero. Blah, blah, blah. Um, The way that they did it creates a lot of problems. But I get what they were going for and what they wanted. So even if it leaves a whole bunch of plot holes and other problems for the character thematically it works so we're gonna leave it there right we're gonna leave that there um so uh black widow um i want to come back to that um hopefully i'll have time to the Tony Stark was also, I felt, a good ending to the character. Um, But I, it's really been sticking with me in this really weird way. Um, 
so just to kind of give you a background on me, um, when it comes to comic books and Marvel, um, I started reading comic books in the early 90s, and uh, the comic books that I read uh, for a while uh, when it came to Marvel was anything that had X in the title, and <clears throat> uh, I stopped reading them uh, just after Onslaught, I think, is when I stopped. Um, the whole Onslaught storyline really disappointed me. Um, I, I felt like I, I felt like they were pointing in a direction and chickened out, um, and that did not make me happy. But that's just my opinion. Uh, it is worth. I don't have any change in my pockets right now, so that's how much it's worth. But it's my opinion. The anyway, so that's that. As far as anything that I knew of any other characters, uh, pretty much revolved around their interactions with the X Men and the other X groups. Um, so there was not comic book wise a whole lot of uh, uh, attachment that I made to any of the other characters. When uh, the MCU started, I thought that the casting of Robert Downey Jr. for Tony Stark, based on what I knew of the character of Tony Stark, was brilliant on a meta level. Um, I grew up in the 80s, so I remember younger uh, Robert Downey Jr. and the kind of trouble and the struggles that he went through in his younger life. And uh, <clears throat> given that and uh, how he came through that and the parallels with the character of Tony Stark, I thought that was just such an incredible match of character to actor. Um, I just thought it was really neat. So, and I like the performance that he gave. I like the way that they developed the character of Tony Stark and over the course of the movies, um, both in the Iron Man movies and the Avenger movies. So, I don't know if he is my favorite character in the MCU, um, but he is definitely one of my most favorite characters in the MCU. Um, and I knew was going to have to die in this movie. Um, I did. I know that there was talk about, well, him and Pepper would just go off and have a kid or whatever, but no. Um, the way that they had him set up to be paralleled, uh, and a foil to Thanos, um, that kind of paralleling, and then on top of that, having him become a mentor uh, to Peter Parker. Um, both of those kind of spell this character is going to die. It's just what happens with that type of a character, that type of paralleling, and then the mentoring thing. Um, so. There was that, and then there's a whole lot of closure that they did with Tony in Endgame. Um, there's plot closure. In Infinity War, um, there's the whole thing with Thanos trying to get the Time Stone. Um, Tony's in peril. Doctor Strange jumps through, like, it's like four million possible timelines or something like that um, and he only finds one where they succeed and he tells Thanos he'll give him the time stone but Tony has to live and then in Endgame there's the conversation between the Ancient One and, uh, and Bruce Banner where you know if Strange gave the time stone to Thanos there had to be a purpose in that. 
and this was the purpose that Tony was the one in a million chance that they succeed um, that one in a million chance was Tony's sacrifice so you know that all wrapped up very cleanly and then there was just closure for Tony in the time travel part of the plot um, Tony gets to see his father again and they get to have father bonding moment even though you know uh, his father doesn't know who he's talking to but Tony does and they're talking about impending fatherhood for his father uh, Howard Howard Stark and um, you know Tony's own you know new fatherhood is he now has a kid with Pepper because you know over the course of the movie five years have passed and it's a really touching thing. Um, you can tell that is a big moment of closure for Tony. So you have that. And then um, in all of the interactions with his child, he's a good father. He's loved by his child. He's got a good relationship with uh, Pepper to the point that in the big fight, uh, Pepper is there with the rescue armor. Um, fighting alongside her husband and everybody else. Um, so there is not a thing of regret with relationships or anything like that. Um, you know, Tony's doing everything he can to make sure he holds on to this new life that he's got and help the universe. He's not going to sacrifice. It goes back to Infinity War. Um, he's not going to sacrifice the life of his new child to save the world any more than he would sacrifice anybody else to save the world. It's not Tony. Um, and, it, and he carries through with that the whole time. The plan that they have is not going to change the present. It's just going to bring everybody back. And, um, and so, yeah, it's There is not, you know, a struggle with the kid that he that anybody regrets. There's not a struggle with Pepper that anybody regrets or any of that. It's Tony dies a hero. Um, he dies plot wise with all of that wrapping neatly uh, for his personal subplot plot of the plot, and he dies with closure with not only his child and his wife but also closure where his his dead father is concerned and when he died on screen it was impactful and it was affecting I wanted to cry and I could not cry um I just couldn't and I think that all of that is why because this idea of the grief that we have, part of that grief is lack of closure. Um, there's always something when somebody dies that's left unsaid, that's left undone. And, you know, even his falling out with Captain America from Civil War is resolved over the course of Endgame. The two of them have made up. Um, the two of them are back and a team. And, yeah, it's, it's one of those deaths with no regrets. And I could not bring myself to cry. And I don't know if anybody else feels that way. <laughs> Um, you know, watching, like, I watched Kevin Smith's review and he's tearing up talking about it. And I'm like, but I couldn't cry. I just couldn't. Um, I think that it was too perfect. And I don't know if it's a thing of we're trying to make plots 
as perfect as we can because of the brand of criticism that comes from things like cinema sins or if it is a or if it's just good writing on its own um I don't know I don't know um but yeah uh so Tony Stark gone gonna miss him um the such a weird shadow on my face um so yeah that's there's that um so one of the movies I did not get out to go see yet and I really wanted to was Miss, was uh, Captain Marvel and I'm going to at some point I don't know when I'm going to be able to get out to go see it um uh, but, um, again, she's another character that I know, uh, from her intersection with X characters. Um, and I was excited to see, uh, her get a movie. Um, hers is a movie I still want to see. And, knowing that she was going to be an end game, I was really excited to see her. And then I was really disappointed. Um, I get, so I run role playing games, uh, for, um, my friends and family. And, um, it could be really difficult when you have characters overpowered for something to figure out how to not have those characters break what's going on. Um, and as a writer, I've experienced the situation of, hmm, I made this character too powerful for what I'm trying to do. Captain Marvel's a cosmically powerful character. Um, and I get being afraid of her breaking the plot. But. <laughs> big but. The time travel plot was not something that a character like that was going to break. Um, it None of what happened with any of that is something that could have been brute forced through. Um, if it could have, I mean, well, uh, okay, Hulk wouldn't have done it because uh, he's smart Hulk now, but yeah, it's not something that a super powered character like that would have broken. Um, and so I'm really disappointed that there was not more utilization of her character in the movie um, because of her power and the way that she's shown there's a lot of CGI uh, from the look of it that goes into the presentation of her character and because she was so underutilized it really felt like she was more CGI than she was a character and an actress on the screen and I did not like that um, at all. Um, I wanted to see more of her. And I wanted to see... I just wanted to see more of her. Um, I don't think that having more involvement with her character would have taken anything away. I don't think it would have broken the plot. Um... So, I don't know why she was underutilized, and I don't like the impression that it left with her character on the screen. It just, it does, it, it just, it, that deeply disappointed me. Um, so, yeah. <clears throat> um... The 
other big thing that I wanted to talk about with Infinity War, uh, or within game, um, is Black Widow. Um, Black Widow is dead, uh, and so first of all, I'm going to say because um, I've heard this said, um, you know, how could the Infinity Stones not bring her back if they're in infinitely powerful? Um, because if you're something infinitely powerful and you set a cost to you being obtained, you are not going to allow your power to be used to undo that cost. That's the point of the sacrifice you demanded. Um, it makes perfect sense uh, thematically and plot-wise that when Bruce tries to bring Natasha back that he can't. It makes perfect sense. Um, so I see no issue there. Um, in Infinity War, um, Thanos sacrifices Gamora in order to get the Soul Stone. And hear my exasperation there. There is a lot there yeah it it's kind of one of those okay fine I'll buy it since you insist this is the thing, but yeah, and it is a huge problematic element um, from the standpoint of looking at the effect of, you know, at media effect, and yeah. I'm not, a lot of people um, have touched on that uh, to argue it far better than I think I could sitting in my car doing a blog where I'm umming every few sentences. So I'm not going to touch that. Um, I kind of felt like the sacrifice of Black, of, of Black Widow was a foil and parallel to Gamora's sacrifice by Thanos. Um, Clint does not want her to die. Um, the whole little fight that the two of them have is all about who is going to die in place of the other. And I thought that was great. Um, I thought it was great for their characters and the relationship that these two people have. Um, and I thought it was 100% fitting um, on behalf of both characters to fight the way that they did to be the one to die. Um, and I have... From a feminist perspective, I do not have any problem with Black Widow's death. Um, I think that the whole scene played out very, very well. Up to, you know, Clint doing everything. Once, you know, they've both gone over the cliff in the fight. Um, she's trying to tell him to let go, and he doesn't want to, and... Yeah, I, nothing about that scene felt bad to me. Um, I thought it was good. I thought it kept uh, character agency very well. Um, you know, you know going in, one of them's going to have to die because that's how you get the soul stone. Um, so you know it's got to happen. And they had to know it was going to happen. If they didn't, you know, but I, I'm pretty sure that they did. I'm pretty sure that they were warned and told because they were with Nebula. Even if they did not know about 
the death of Gamora before they would have known by the time they're going. Um, I don't remember the nitty gritty of the conversation. I've only seen this movie once. So, yeah. Um, as far as, you know, the scene itself, um, I personally don't see any kind of issues with it. None of the problematic stuff involved with the mirrored scene from Infinity War. Um, that said, I kind of feel like there is a foil aspect to the inherent themes or the inherent themes involved with the death of Gamora. All of these problematic themes that um, were examined and analyzed and picked apart uh, after Infinity War came out. Um, I kind of feel like there is a foil aspect to Black Widow's sacrifice. And that's the thing that I can't decide how I feel about. Um, so, because there is a Gamora now that was not sacrificed um, and she by her let's not mince words here very abusive father and she was not sacrificed because of as a result of the actions that another character took in thwarting that abusive father. And I kind of feel like there is a message in that. And I don't know if it is an... It's probably not intentional uh, from the creator's message. I think it is something that can be read into it from an audience perspective. But I'm not, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think there's a message that can be read there. And that's the thing that I'm not sure if what can be read there is a positive thing or not. Um, and so, yeah. Because there is this definite parallel. Um, you have Thanos who is who supposedly loves his daughter and is willing to sacrifice her. And you have uh, Clint and Natasha um, who are super friends and completely unwilling to sacrifice each other and one has to sacrifice the other. And where Thanos just pushes her off um with a patronizing tear in his eye, uh, Clinton and Natasha fight until they both almost die um, to keep from having to sacrifice each other to be the one that goes instead. And there is that thematic parallel between, you know, what is true sacrifice, but at the same time, you can't ignore that there is going to be something that can be read otherwise because of these other elements because media does not exist in a vacuum um, it exists 
and plays out to a world that has real world issues with, you know, abuse and with treatment of women and on and on. So, yeah, um, that's kind of the thing that's really tossing around in my head that I'm just not sure. I don't know quite how I feel about what that says as a foil to that theme that I can't decide if it is saying something positive or if it can say something positive to that and with regards to foiling that theme um, and, and those problems. So that's, that's kind of the thing that, that I've been struggling with and, and thinking about and considering. Uh, and I'm going to say that, you know, these thoughts do not taint, um, how I feel about the resolution of that thing, of that scene in Endgame. Um, like I said, it's, it's a strong scene and it's affecting and, um, it's, perfect for the characters that it's taking place with, um, for the rules and everything set up in the universe, it all makes sense, um, looking at it, you know, in a world that the media exists around, again, you know, I'm not bothered by the scene that took place and how it played out and all of that, um, it's just you know, looking at this additional element and what do I think of this additional element? How do I feel about it? And that's just what I can't decide on. Um, I think there's a lot of things with this movie that are going to stick with me for a while. Um, cause like I said, even, even though I could not cry for some of these moments that I wanted to be able to cry for, like Tony's death, um, it was still impacting and while the movie left me disappointed with some things like the utilization of Carol Danvers um, it was still a satisfying movie and it still has a lot of impact and I think some of these things are things that I'm probably going to be thinking about and wanting to talk about uh, for a while and probably in the future and um, I think that um the soul stone sacrifice will probably be something that I'll probably want to come back to in the future. Um, probably when I have some time to, you know, uh, sit down and read through stuff and, and really write out thoughts and, and get stuff down and, and set into something scripted. But, um, yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, the end was pretty cool. Um, all the heroes getting to come back. That was, that was kind of awesome. Uh, the theater that I was in, everybody cheered for it. Um, it was, and it, it was an epic moment. Um, it was pretty cool. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't really notice the girl power move, moment of all the, of all the female characters standing together. <laughs> I didn't. Um, and I don't. I think that one of the reasons for that is that I kind of felt cheated by uh, Mar uh, Captain Marvel's uh, underutilization. Um, it's kind of hard to make me feel happy for a girl power moment when you fail that hugely on the girl power. Um, you can't hand me a token when you kind of crap on me. Um, so, yeah. Um, but, you know, there's that. Um, what else? Because I got a little bit more time. Um, so the other, uh, big element is the time travel. Um, 
time travel in movies is always sticky and gooey and wibbly wobbly. Um, it's easy to really just totally screw up time travel plots um, because there are so many ways to do time travel and people aren't always consistent in how they do time travel. I will say that um, I felt with the exception of Steve Rogers and again uh, for a thematic resolution to the wholesome American hero we are going to let Captain America have his wholesome American ending. Um, so we're not going to touch that. We're not going to look at that. We're going to pretend like it doesn't exist for the purposes of this next bit. Um, accepting any of the Steve Rogers conundrum, um, I thought that they did a good job with regards to uh, the time travel plot and the rules that they were going with for time travel for this universe. Um, you know, there's some argument as to what happens and can you change this and, you know, you know, back to the future, call back and blah, blah, blah. It was, it was cute. It was funny. Um, and it made for some fun banter. Um, I think that when we get the uh, rules from the person holding the time stone of here's how it works when you change time. Um, I think it's a safe bet to say that's how time travel works. Um, I think that person is an authority and can be trusted. Um, I want to say that in the Doctor Strange movie that time was reversed um, for things to be changed. Um, I'm hoping I'm thinking of the live action movie and not the animated one because, <laughs> um, but if I am right and that did happen in, uh, the MCU, uh, strange movie, um, I don't think you'd be looking at a creation of an alternate timeline there. Because, um, from what I recall, it was uh, short and immediate. And it would be the equivalent of something happening, being in your short-term memory, and not going over to long-term memory. And so it's forgotten, and it's not going to affect what you do. Um, because not remembering it, you can't think about it and act on it. Um, so a, a brief time rewind is not going to create an alternate universe because there's not been enough time for things to shape around that outcome. Um, whereas, you know, taking out items, if you don't return them, would. And we have two alternate timelines, uh, both of which are interesting to me. Um, the first alternate timeline is Loki. Um, I think the I think Loki disappearing with uh, the Tesseract um, when they make their first attempt to get it. Um, I have a feeling that is setting up for um, the new series that's coming out, uh, coming out or has come out. I think coming out um, uh, for Loki. It just that seems obvious to me. Um, the um, other timeline is so 2014 Thanos is who gets drawn into the future by uh, Plant Nebula uh, and who they fight at the end which means that in 2014 all of a sudden the person who has been going across the galaxy destroying half the population of planets is suddenly gone. 
And that is a huge power vacuum. I'm really interested to see if somebody would pick that up and do something with it. And I think, I was kind of thinking about this this morning when I uh, uh, tried to do this and I uh, kept dropping my phone, um, which is why I did it again. But um, so Marvel bought 20th Century Fox, which means that um, they should own or come to be owning um, the X-Men. Um, and I don't think that the Shi'ar have been part of the MCU. Um, and I think that a, a timeline where you have a huge power vacuum all of a sudden would be a perfect time to show the Shi'ar come into prominence uh, and become a force to be reckoned with. And um, I think that would be, if you're going to bring um, the X-Men into the MCU, I think would be a place to do so as you know, putting them into that alternate reality and then using another overarching plot like maybe Secret Wars or something else, who knows, um, to then uh, recombine uh, those timelines uh, somehow. And uh, so that's something that I would kind of like to see um, because there is this power vacuum that exists in that all and what is now an alternate timeline and I am very interested to see what could happen what could be done with it um, because I don't think that Thanos suddenly disappearing from that time is going to be something that is just a meh okay whatever I think that that's something that's going to have a ripple effect that's a power vacuum. So yeah, um, those are my thoughts on Endgame. Um, overall, I liked the movie. I thought it was good. Um, so yeah, I did not expect this to be the first video that I put up trying to get uh, a channel going. Um, I was, wasn't expecting to vlog like this. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, but it, there was a lot within game, um, and I wanted to talk about it. Um, I probably will talk about it again. Um, and when I do, um, if you liked this, I hope that, uh, you'll be back. Um like, share, subscribe. Um, I have a Patreon. I'm going to put it in the description. Um, I am going to, in the future, in the not too near future, I hope, um, start putting up uh, videos where I am talking about um, literary criticism and uh, with books and with movies, um, maybe with music as well, um, or at least, you know, utilizing themes in music and tying it to stuff. Um, and if that sounds interesting at all, I hope that you'll, uh, come back and check it out. So, um, until then, peace.